on it since then, um, raising awareness of sustainable menstruation as well as taboos and other anatomy, science, many things in universities. We've gone to villages, slum areas. We take sessions everywhere and with anyone. Um, and we're very happy to be back and taking a session with you today. So we'd like to start the session today with, I'll just quickly give you a rundown of what we'll be talking about and what the format is going to be. So it will be about an hour long and we'll cover the anatomy. We will be covering sanitary napkins and tampons. We'll be breaking them apart for you. And then we'll go to sustainable alternatives like biodegradable pads, cloth pads, and uh, menstrual cups. And then we will have a small section on taboos and then we will end with a few you can also type in your questions um, in the chat box throughout and we will answer them if, if, if we can in the moment, otherwise we'll definitely answer them at the end. So you can keep doing that. And we would like, I also want to just remind everyone to keep your mics and cameras off. You can turn on your mics at the very end when you want to ask a question. Okay, so to start, we'd like you to when I say, what is the first word that comes to your mind when I say menstruation or periods? Uh, if you can just type it into the chat box. It could be good, it could be bad, it could be anything. So for me, it needs regeneration. Cramps, <laughs> pain, blood, discomfort, mood swings, annoyance, natural pain, hurts. Yeah, definitely, definitely. blood, stress, right? And you can see that there's so much variety and every, every menstruator goes to very different experiences. Renewal, right. So chocolate, <laughs> that's a nice one. Um, so I'm going to hand over the mic to Ahana now, who's going to take you through the anatomy and the science of menstruation briefly. Hello. Yeah, Anna, we can hear you. Hi. Yeah, okay. Can you see me? Because uh, I, I don't really know. Hi. Hi, so I'll be briefly talking to you about um, the external and internal anatomy and also about the phases of the menstrual cycle. So we're often taught that um, our anatomy, especially our external anatomy, looks a certain way, but that's not really true. This is just one of the versions of the way it can look. So your external anatomy of your genitalia is called the vulva. It's all, often like a, we misterm it and we think it's called the vagina, but that's the internal canal and opening. So the external um, area is called the vulva. So this consists of, as you can see uh, in green, the labia majora. These are the outer lips of the labia. Um, they form a protective layer and they can, they come in, it, it, this skin can be in various colors from pink to crimson to reddish brown. And it can also be smooth or wrinkled. That's all normal. Then comes the uh, labia minora, which is the inner lips. So this forms a protective layer of the vestibule, which is the inner skin of the labia minora. And also it forms a protective uh, shield towards the urethral openings and uh, the, the vaginal opening. So the size of this, people often think that the size of the labia minora is smaller than the size of the labia majora but sometimes it can also be bigger 
sometimes it is the same style all of these are absolutely normal so like i mentioned it protects the vestibule and the vestibule in turn protects the opening the vaginal opening and the vestibule is also a place with a lot of nerve endings so it the labia uh, minora and the labia majora are sort of a double protection and then comes the clitoris so the inner labia connects to form the clitoral hood and the clitoral hood protects over 8000 nerve endings of the clitoris um the clitoris looks really small but it extends back into your body making a wishbone sort of shape and um, each side that it in, uh, extends into is called a cura and each side of that is 3 inches so it appears very small but it is actually a really big um uh, it's really big in size and uh, the urethral opening is located right below the clitoris um it's in dark pink also and it's connected to the bladder through the urethra tube nothing can go in from this opening sometimes we get the question that what if like like how do i know where to insert the menstrual cup and this is a perfectly normal question we are not educated about our body as much like we are not taught in schools and colleges uh, so nothing can go back from this opening then comes the uh, vagina which refers to the internal canal in the in purple you can see the vaginal opening it expands and contracts but despite what some people think it doesn't is it does not stretch that is a myth then comes the dam area this is the area between uh, the rest of your vulva and your anus it is an area that has several nerve endings which is something that's uh, just an interesting fact uh, so now let's move on to the internal anatomy and uh, so i will be talking to you about the internal anatomy and uh, the phase of menstruation side by side so first as soon as um, at the entrance of the vagina comes the hymen or the vaginal corona which we will talk more about later then comes the cervix the cervix and the cervical canal so the cervix it feels like the tip of your nose and the center of the cervix <laughs> is where you actually bleed from Hello. Yeah, please continue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the cervical uh, canal is a long neck-like passage at the lower end of your uterus, and uh, here I haven't shown it, but there's also the pelvic floor, which is a which is a sling of muscles that supports your uterus, vagina, bladder, intestines, and rectum, allowing them to function properly. So this is a pretty important part. So menstruation is a cycle, and it actually starts in your brain in the section called the hypothalamus. It releases and produces substance, which travel down to the pituitary gland and stimulate it. So first comes so as you know the um, as you know menstruation is a cycle, and it repeats month after the month. So it starts from the on the first day of your period is the first uh, part of your cycle and it's called the menstrual phase this phase usually lasts from 3 to 7 days well, how can you tell if you are on this phase so of course you bleed but interestingly um what to bleed is not just blood only 35% of your menstrual fluids are blood the rest is mucus and other fluids and on an average a person bleeds only around 6 to 12 teaspoons of blood we usually think uh, ganga yamuna bhere but that's not really the key okay. um during the 3 to 7 days the person may not have a visible flow throughout it may start on day 1 stop on day 2 start again on day 3 or anything like that that is perfectly normal there is nothing wrong with that then comes the follicular phase which on an average lasts for 14 days here the main event starts on your ovaries um, that are in green here 
so the ovaries are uh, lumpy and shaped and grape sized and they're on either side of your uterus this is where where, where eggs are stored and produced and the luteinizing hormone starts to make changes during this period and um, estrogen stimulates the lining of the uterus to make it ready to ovulate during this time it does typically ovulate this is the time when people are most fertile and how to know you are in this phase or the follicular phase is that vaginal secretions get thinner and have a consistency of uncooked egg whites this happens because it's the best uh, this the, through this secretion it's the best environment to get to reach to the eggs then comes the secretory or luteal phase so right after ovulation uh should we talk in hindi is that uh, what everyone is comfortable with sorry i just saw that um is anyone not comfortable in english you can type that in because uh, doing a bilingual session will take a little bit longer hindi Sorry, folks. I, I'm um, unfortunately I might be the only foreigner in the group, uh, but I can't understand Andy in this context. So um, right. if I'm the only if, foreigner, then I can duck out. If and uh, I'll, I'll, we'll do this again another time. No, no, no. That is that is okay. Is there anyone who doesn't understand English? Maybe what we can do is speak more clearly. Would that be helpful? Uh, it would be nice if we continued in English. Okay. Okay, we've gotten quite a few requests for English, so we'll continue in English. Um, you can always just message. You can message me personally on Zoom if you need help uh, understanding anything. Yeah, and by the way, Anjali, we're uh, just we're also planning some uh, Hindi session some yes, we are. later. Yeah. So let's conduct this in English since we had you know stated that. And uh, let's go ahead. Yeah, uh, Ahana, okay. just uh, can you just move yeah. your camera a little? And you, sometimes your mic is not very clear. I can't actually see myself, so okay. I don't know why. I think I can. Yeah. You're you're actually accessing another camera. You are to your left. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That camera. That is where you are visible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I can't. Uh, yeah. You're good. You're good. Right. Keep going. You're let's, good. You're let's good. Continue. I just need to focus on what I'm saying anyway. Okay. So where was that? So um, I think I was in the luteal phase. So right uh, after ovulation, the FSH hormone releases the egg, and the egg matures, and the ovary ruptures to release the egg into the fallopian tubes, which extend on either side of the uterus. From uh, the fallopian tubes, um, the egg travels to the uterus through a series of contractions. This is also when the progesterone hormone releases, and this hormone uh, helps in nourishing and housing the egg in case it has to be fertilized, and it also signals to our body not to produce eggs anymore. So, um, and this time hormones also prepare the lining of the uterus to house an egg should it be fertilized. So how to how to tell if you are in the luteal phase? The vagina secretion gets uh, thicker and tasty, and the vagina may feel more dry. Hi, sweetie. I'm sorry to interrupt you, honey, um, but I think your mic is falling down from your face, and so um, there's not many people that can hear you. You might have to repeat yourself there. Okay. Uh, where did you show me till? I'll just hold it. You can repeat actually because oh, of it was not free. I repeat what, everything uh, you just said. I apologize. Okay. Okay. No problem. Um. So, after the follicular phase comes the luteal phase. So this is right after ovulation. This is when. the follicle stimulating hormone releases the egg and the egg matures and at this time the ovary ruptures to release the egg into the fallopian tube 
from the fallopian tube the um it travels to the uterus through a series of contractions at this time progesterone hormone releases to nourish and house the egg so this also helps in um creating a fertile environment for your egg in cs it's the uh, fertilized and it also the progesterone hormone sign signals the egg not to um release any more i mean signals your body not to release any more eggs um uh, at this time the hormones also start preparing a lining to the uterus in case it has to be fertilized so how to tell if you are in the secretory or luteal phase your vaginal secretions get thicker and pasty and your vagina may feel more dry if you if you get fertilized your progesterone levels increase if not fertilized your progesterone levels drop and that is what causes the period this is also during the end of this um, luteal phase is also when you experience pms if you do experience it yeah so that covers the this aspect anjali if you have any questions regarding anything i just mentioned you can uh, put it in the chat box and i'll answer them okay so suravi is now going to uh, Take over. Hi everyone. So I'm briefly going to talk about um, what's in a pad, what's in a tampon, and the health and environmental effects of using pads and tampons. And that's um, our volunteer mind about that. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Okay. Awesome. So I'm assuming that most of you use a pad, and I grew up using a pad because I just there was no other option. I just didn't know that anything else existed, and for many years I just used a pad, and then I realized that I don't want to be using a pad anymore because it sucks, um, and we never really talk about. what pads are made out of because we never really question these things and once you start looking for information about what goes into a pad you find that people are not really talking about this the companies that make them are not really talking about this and there's really not enough information and companies don't really reveal all of their in, like materials that they use and it's really difficult to get um reliable information so we did a little digging into what goes into a pad and here it is so we took apart an actual pad and these are the different layers so this is the back sheet um that the pad comes in and it's made from plastic and siliconized paper then there's the bottom layer of the pad this one it's the one that sticks to your underwear and that is non permeable and it's made from plastic polyethylene and after that is this little thing these are the ones that increase the absorption of the blood these are called super absorbent polymers and they are the ones that absorb all your blood and they also cause the bloating of the pad this little thing this one is um made from cellulose wood pulp often rayon and viscose and it often contains pesticides pesticide residues and rayon and viscose are known to release something called dioxins this is a chemical that we are going to be talking about and then this is the top layer this is the um peel dry permeable top mesh layer and it's made from another type of plastic which is polypropylene so that's the bad um now we're going to move on to what is in a tampon 
a tampon. Anjali, can you change the slides? Yes, sorry. Thank you. Okay, so this is what a tampon looks like. Can you see it? Okay, this is what a tampon looks like when it's new. It comes in this little sheet thing. And this is what it looks like when it's opened. So I'm gonna do a little thing where I have a glass of water and I'm gonna put the tampon in and you can see how quickly it's gonna float up. It absorbed all the water and this is what it looks like now. It absorbed water so quickly and it's so bloated. So essentially a tampon is inserted into your vagina, it goes inside um, and this, this string is used to pull it out and a tampon could be arguably worse for your body because it's inside your body instead of just outside and tampons are no better of course. So as you can see in the image, um, all of the outer part is made from cotton and rayon and that's what absorbs it. The, there's like, there's a thin fabric around it, which is made from polyethylene and polypropylene. And the string is cotton, polypropylene and polyester. And there are unknown fragrances, of course, that nobody discloses and pesticide residues. And the thing with tampons is that they're inside your body and you can see that there's, you can, there's little things that come out of it, as you can see. So this, this thing, it came out of a tampon and it just stays in your body. It stays in, inside your vagina, which is really not the best thing. So that's tampons. Um, and now we're going to talk about dioxins. These are the chemicals that are, that are released from cellulose, wood pulp, rayon, viscose, chlorine bleach. Um, pads and tampons also have chlorine bleach in them. That's why they're so white. They use it to whiten it, to make it look clean. So dioxins are, the World Health Organization listed dioxins as one of the dirty dozen most harmful organic pollutants. They are released from chlorine bleach and they're a byproduct of rayon and viscose. The, your vagina, your vulva has, is um, made from really permeable and super absorbent tissue. So this tissue absorbs all the chemicals and all the everything that you put near it directly and it goes directly into your bloodstream because there is no filtration process that takes place. These dioxins get accumulated in the body's fat tissues because the body doesn't really know what to do with them. They can stay in your body for up to 12, sorry, up to 20 years because the body just doesn't know what to do with them. And dioxins can cause ovarian and cervical cancer, abnormal cell growth, infertility, and something that is often um, related to using tampons is the toxic shock syndrome. It's not super common, but it can be fatal. Yeah. And now I'm going to ask Mahi to talk about the environmental effects. Hello. Um, can everyone see and hear me, hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, so I will be assuming that most of you use pads. I will be talking about what exactly happens to these pads once we've disposed of them and what the effects of this is on our environment. So I'll just start off with a couple of quick questions. So how do all of you, the menstruators in this call, uh, dispose of your 
paths once you're done using them monthly. You can feel free to just type it into the chat box. Right, so we usually just wrap it and throw it into our dustbins, uh, into uh, the same dustbins as um, the normal waste. And this is, right, and do you have any idea who collects it and where it goes after you've thrown it into your dustbin? Again, just feel free to just type that in. Right, exactly. So they, someone did answer very correctly. They do, most of them do end up in landfills. And the fact is that 12 billion of these pads are generated yearly in India. And all of these end up in landfills. And the thing is that these, this huge number of pads, it's just created by a very small percentage of menstruators in India because most people who menstruate in India do not even use pads. So just imagine if every menstruator used a pad, a synthetic pad. And it's not just the volume of waste that's created when one uses a pad that's concerning, but it's also just the amount of time one pad takes to biodegrade. Again, I think it would be really interesting to hear from you how much time you think just one pad takes to degrade naturally. Just a quick number would do. Okay, 12 years. Okay. I would say aim a little higher, much higher. So in fact, actually, <laughs> hundreds also way off. One pad on an average takes can take up to 800 years. Okay, 2000 is a little much, but 800 years to degrade. And if you think about it, that means that the first pad ever created is still sitting around somewhere there in the soil. So, or wherever it's been put. So, it's, it's, we also have to think about, so all these pads that are being put into landfills, we need to think about what materials they're made up of because that's what's going into these landfills, right? So as we've seen, they're made up of chemicals and loads of plastic. To just put that into perspective for you, one pad contains around four plastic bags worth of plastic and one menstruator takes an, uh, uses an average of around 10,000 pads in a, a lifetime. So if you just calculate that, that would mean one in use, if you used a pad through your lifetime as a menstruator, you would use around 40,000 plastic bags worth of plastic. And, and all of this is going into our soil and this contains chemicals too, right? And these chemicals, when they mix with our blood, which is organic, create a very hazardous create very hazardous substances which then leach into our soil into our groundwater table and into rivers and this is just the tip of the iceberg of what happens when you use pads and put them into landfills and it's not just the environment that's being affected by this though right because from when you put it into your dustbin at home to when it goes into a landfill they ha you have people managing this entire process so these people are rack pickers and other sorts of workers who have to directly come in contact with these pads and unfortunately more often than not these pads aren't wrapped properly and they're very insufficiently and inappropriately disposed of and just think about this people have to with like not enough protection very often they have to touch this with their hands, other people's menstrual waste, and work with this every day. And 
other than just being very disgusting, if you think about it, because none of us would be willing to do that. This also has very real consequences for their health. Like it's known to cause skin infections and like gastrointestinal infections. And it would, it, it also causes eye infections and they just, this is their, this is their livelihood. And ideally, uh, someone did mention, they wrap it up in a newspaper and put a red mark on it. That is how one should ideally dispose pads if they are using pads. And this should be collected by a collection agency that then takes it to an incinerator and burns it at a very, very high temperature. Uh, unfortunately, in India, this does not happen because due to a lack of infrastructure, there aren't enough incinerators and medical waste is given priority over menstrual waste. So, so, so right, so that should be the ideal process, but that's very far from what actually happens. And honestly, the first time I had this conversation and looked at this whole process of like what happens, I was very shocked and I really questioned my choices as a consumer of like pads because there are so many sustainable and very convenient options out there. And that is what Sayuri will be talking about next, about some sustainable alternatives to tampons and pads that are synthetic. Before we just want to quickly add in, someone did mention that they flush tampons down the toilet um, and you have a septic tank. I would really urge you to throw away your tampons because when tampons get mixed into the water, someone has to separate them and they can cause a lot of clogging in your toilet. Okay, Sayuri. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, uh, great. So now that we've talked about the things which are problematic, um, we want to provide some solutions, some alternatives that you can use. So first I will be talking about biodegradable. So what pad looks like. So as you can see, it is identical to the normal pads we use except for the fact that it's completely bio. I don't think your video is on. Yeah, it's on. Okay, um, Sayuri's uh, internet is quite bad today. So I'm going to go ahead and continue this so that we do. Yes. Uh, okay, so we'll talk about biodegradable um, bats. I'll just change the slide. There we go. Okay. So this is, I hope you can all see me. This is what a biodegradable pad looks like. Um, it looks very much like plastic, I agree. But it's actually made from, there's a variety of materials that can be made from bamboo fiber, corn fiber, corn starch. And this is called bioplastic. It's still not 100% biodegradable, but it is a lot better than synthetic plastic. Um, on the camera, I don't know if you can tell the color, but it's slightly off-white. And this is because the cotton that's used and the bamboo fiber are both already off-white. So there is no added bleach or any other chemicals in this. If you're getting it from a good company, the cotton should also be organic, ideally. Uh, usually, if you bury these, depending on the company again, they should be, they should be biodegradable within around six months, three to six months. Um, you can also throw them away normally in your trash can and if they do end up in the landfill, they will degrade over there. Again, this depends on the company and usually the company gives you instructions on how to dispose these pads. Apart from that, it's used just like a normal pad. It can absorb equally as much amount of blood as your normal pad also. And it comes in sizes, so you have small sizes for, um, I can check if I have a small size. You can get little panty liners as well, which you can use on days that you are not menstruating. I do have one. Here we go. It's a small one. You can use it on the days you're not menstruating to collect any fluid. And you also have big ones and uh, pads with different thicknesses, so it depends on your flow. 
usually they are a little bit more expensive if you want a good company they can cost up to 20 rupees actually 20 25 as well um but they do start at 3 rupees uh generally we found that there's two really great brands which are heyday and carnacy these are both indian brands and heyday is around 10 to 12 rupees per pack depending on which type of pack you go for and carnacy can go between 15 to 20 and most of these companies have a package where you can buy um a bunch of them in bulk and or say not in bulk or it's be like a monthly subscription so you can order those and they'll deliver them to your house every week we will share uh, you can send out an email with the links to all of these websites after the talk or i can do it after this section they are um they are delivering even during the quarantine so you can order these packs and you can always try a few before deciding whether or not you want to switch to them um they also if you use these packs you know the typical period smell that you get when you use a sanitary napkin I'm sure you, you sure you've experienced it. That is something you won't get because uh, that smell is actually a result of your blood mixing in with the bag. It's not the smell of your blood. You also shouldn't get rashes or itchiness, which you you, you usually would um, when you're using a a normal bag. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions about this? You can put them in the comments, and I will quickly answer them. um okay if there's no questions right now you can always keep putting in your questions uh i will move i'll move to um cloth pads now i'm sure you've heard of cloth pads so so i mean before sanitary napkins came into the market most women did use cloth and there's recently this myth going around that cloth isn't safe to use this is absolutely not true cloth itself is not unsafe to use it's been used for generations it's just how you take care of it now cloth pads can be a little bit more maintenance but they are also a lot healthier and they are reusable so this is what a cloth pad looks like this is an eco fam cloth pad and it's a regular size cloth pad so you can notice that it has uh, the wings and the wings have a button so just how you have a flap um in your sanitary napkins it sticks around your underwear this can also get clipped around your underwear like this and so that it does come loose and it stays in place you can use it depending on your flow you can use it from 4 to 6 hours and it's completely feel dry so just because it's cloth you are not going to feel wet when you're wearing it it does uh, it dries because your blood is in contact with the air so your blood will dry on the back um you use it like a normal pad in that you just put it on your underwear and then you can go out you can move around if you're outside what you would do is once your pad is full you fold it in like this so the part that your blood is the part that has your blood you fold the uh, napkin around it like this and then you can use the button to make a little portly a little package like this and this keeps everything inside so it doesn't spill you can carry a cloth pad with you wherever you go and put it in there and then once you get home you can wash it so now how do you wash this you have to first soak it in cold water so what you do is you take the pad and you have to you can dip it in and out of water a few times and that should get out all the blood that was in the pad you can leave it soaking for a few hours as well that's quite helpful and this should get rid of most of your blood um the more time you leave it soaking the better it is the more blood will come out uh, after that you just wash it with detergent and you try to not use a brush it's best if you can just rub the pad against itself like this because any brush would make um the pad quite rough and then it might poke you so that is how you wash it after this you have to dry it in the sun now this is a very important part and this is a huge reason why pads are usually discouraged in places where menstruation is a taboo and it's also why pads are considered um, pads are considered unhealthy when you don't dry a cloth pad in the sun it's going to grow bacteria and it's going to stay damp this is very unhealthy for you and it can lead to a lot of infections so as long as you are making sure that you wash it properly and dry it in the sun your pad is absolutely safe to use and it can be used for up to 2 to 5 years depending on how well you take care 
even in villages where women are already using um, cloth pads, it's not necessarily that they need to start using sanitary napkins. It's just that we need to talk more about menstruation so that they feel comfortable drying it um, outside in the sun. Uh, there is also another type of cloth pad which you might be interested in seeing. It's, it almost looks like a handkerchief. So the way you use this is you would fold it um, up like this and it becomes quite thick. This is also a lot easier to wash and dry. So a few, there's quite a few companies which make pads like this. It's also very useful for slum and village areas where there's a taboo around drying pads outside. Uh, if you have any questions about how to use a cloth pad, you can please put them in the comments. Some companies we suggest is Ecofam, Shomota, um, there's a lot more and we have a list of companies in this slide in fact, right here. So definitely Ecofam is a great company, you can go for them. And these are the other ones. Soch also has some great pads. And again, they, the, the price usually ranges between 100 rupees to, it can go up to 500 rupees, depending on which type of pad you're getting from which company and the thickness and all of that. Um, okay, there's a few questions. Won't it smell disgusting carrying it in your bag? No, it won't. Um, when your blood actually doesn't smell bad at all, uh, and especially since you're wrapping it up like this, since it's breathable, that's an important part as well, it will just dry. It's not going to start smelling. It will start smelling if you put it in a plastic bag. So as much as possible, if you can put it in a breathable bag, um, that will be great. Right. And if you have any more questions about them, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Saidi, if you're online and you're able to, would you like to add anything to this? probably has issues with her internet. Yes, we will share the slide as well as, we'll share all the links for these companies and, um, okay, what is the average life of a pad? It depends on how well you're taking care of it. If you don't clean it with a rough brush and you properly wash it and everything, it should last around two to five years easily. Um, some pads also have a PUL layer. Uh, it's a plastic, a slight plastic lining at the back. It can be an eco PUL, which is a basically an eco plastic or a biodegradable plastic layer. So that usually helps prevent uh, the blood from leaking from the back. So it usually runs out after a certain number of washes and you can check this on the website. But the pad is still very usable. That is not an issue. The pad is not going to leak. You can use it for the same amount of time as you use a normal sanitary napkin. Um, a cloth pad will not make your underwear wet. It's, it's not um, going to leak through. The blood stays in the pad. Okay. Um, we are going to now move to menstrual cups. And if you have any more questions, you can please put them in the chat box. So Reva, you want to take over? Hello everyone. Okay, so um, uh, now I'm going to talk about um, a menstrual cup, and this is one more alternative. You can use this um, while on while you're on your period. And um, unlike pads and tampons that which absorb blood, a menstrual cup collects all the blood, and you can um, just uh, dump the blood and reuse the cup. So this is reusable. You don't have to throw this cup, and you can use one menstrual cup. For up to 10 years like the companies say that you can use it up to 10 years but um, we can definitely say that you can use it for a minimum seven to eight years without facing any problem um a menstrual cup is made of medical grade silicon i mean it is made of other things as well but a good menstrual cup which you should use should be made of medical grade silicon now medical grade silicon is used in um, all the medical procedures so it is it does not react with anything so it is completely safe for you to put it inside your body it doesn't react with anything so um, if you put it inside you it's not going to react with your blood it's not there are no chemicals in it it's not going to react that is why it's completely safe for you to use it um, and um, I will also tell you how to dispose it um, so um, after you are done using this cup, after 8 to 10 years, you have to incinerate this cup. 
so um it is not it is easy for you to like you just have to get rid of one cup after using it for 7 to 8 years so you can um really contact a, a hospital or something and make sure that it is incinerated properly that's all you have to do after you are done using this cup okay now um i will talk about how to insert this cup it does look intimidating and probably not, none of you have heard about this before um so don't get scared all of us have been using this cup for almost 3 years now and it's been amazing um okay so let's get started um i'm going to tell you a couple of folds which will make it easier for you to you to insert it um so um one uh, the first fold i i'm going to show is called a c fold for which you have to press the cup a little bit from uh, like this can you see and yeah so it looks like a c um can you see properly uh okay we have the slide as well yeah yeah, yeah. but i'm just yeah okay cool um yeah so this is the first fold and as you can see it is it, it the um the cup has already gotten quite smaller so it's very easy for you to insert it and the second fold is called a shell fold so you for that you um just pinch the top part a little bit and pull it towards you um yeah so the cup looks like a shell kind of like a shell and as you can see the Uh, opening becomes really really tiny and it gets bigger gradually so it's it get, gets easier for you to insert it this fold actually works for a lot more people um so one thing you need to make sure of while you are folding the cup is that there needs to be no air inside the cup because the basic principle on which this cup stays inside your body is that it creates a suction inside you so while you are folding the cup you have to make sure that there's no air inside it so that as soon as you put it inside you it just opens on its own and a suction gets created and then that's how the cup stays inside you for a long time and now how do you make how do you how do you understand if the suction is getting created or if the cup if you've inserted the cup properly so um like um i don't know if you can hear it right now but like as soon as you leave the cup it like you can hear like a small pop sound Uh, you might not hear it but you can feel that the cup has opened properly inside you so while inserting the cup you just have to fold it and insert it a little bit you don't have to put your entire hand or all your fingers inside you can just put it like this much and then it automatically opens on its own and slides in and you need to um, also know that when you are on your period your vagina is extremely lubricated so it's it's slippery so the cup just slides in once you um, leave your hands okay and um, there are also a couple of um, positions that you can try and what works for one person might not work for the other person so you uh, for some people standing up and inserting helps for some people uh, some people prefer squatting and um, inserting the cup or for some people you can also try putting one leg on the ground and putting one uh, on top of something that also helps for some people so i can't tell you right now which fold and which position will work for you it's a learning curve so you're going to have to try different folds and different positions and trust me it doesn't it's not as complicated as it sounds right now just the first few times you'll have to figure out what works for you and after words you'll get a hang of it and it's not that like every time it's uh, you it it won't you won't uh, need to uh, change positions and stuff once you get a hang of it it's really really easy so yeah these are two things you need to try different folds you need to try different positions and um, yes so one more thing um, um okay so how how does this cup or uh, stay inside your body as i said it creates a suction but then it also needs to be around your cervix so now what is your cervix your cervix is um, the opening of your uterus so if this is your uterus this part is is your cervix okay and as i think hana mentioned this before but if you try to put your finger inside your vagina um you will feel the cervix and it feels kind of like the tip of your nose so you will know um, where your cervix is and plus when you're on your period your cervix comes slightly lower than it usually is so it's even easier for you to uh, so it's so the cup will easily uh, go and just fit perfectly around the cervix so now what what if it doesn't fit around the cervix so first of all obviously if it's not around the cervix then the blood 
um someone is saying that the voice is not clear can you hear me you can hear you right audio is breaking in the middle a little bit but okay. it's fine okay 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 do you want me to repeat anything or is it okay fine okay fine okay so um i was saying um what if it doesn't fit uh, around the cervix so if it uh, doesn't uh, if it's not properly around the cervix then um, obviously the blood will come out because your blood is not getting collected inside the cup so it, it will flow out and you'll understand that you have it inserted the cup properly plus you will feel the cup so when you wear the cup you're not supposed to feel it and trust me you really don't feel the cup you might be thinking that oh my god the cup is so big how can you not feel it but um it's not like the cup is pushing some uh, pushing your pushing the walls of your vagina and making space for itself it's there is some there is a tiny space that al already exists inside your vagina you just need to um fold it so that it goes through the opening but after that there is the small space that already exists and that is why the cup is made like that is why the cup has this shape so that it fits perfectly um uh, between the walls of your vagina so you don't feel the cup because you don't have too many nerve endings um around the wall the nerve endings are mostly towards the cervix and your vagina so only if the cup is hitting your cervix you will feel the cup constantly but if it is around the cervix you won't be able to feel the cup so if you don't wear it properly you will constantly feel the cup so that is how you will know that you haven't um, inserted the cup properly um okay one more thing you need to um, remember while wearing the cup is that um, you should not um be very very stressed and very very um, like you should not tell yourself that okay today i have to wear the cup and today i have to get it right and if it doesn't happen most of us obviously tend to get very stressed and that uh, affects like um obviously your body also gets very stressed and your muscles get tight so it becomes even tougher for you to insert the cup so maybe you can maybe if that happens you can just stop trying at that point you can tell yourself that it's okay you can maybe go for a walk just relax meditate if that works for you and uh, try it some other day maybe and um, so yeah um, you might have to try it um, once or like you might have to keep on trying it every cycle but i'm pretty sure um that one fold or the other or if you keep on changing changing the positions and the fold something or the other will work for you and um, yeah so um, about uh, anjali and now we'll talk about the uh, costing and everything so if you have any questions you can ask us um, at the end of the session yeah anjali yeah okay so once the cup is inside you what can you do um with the cup inside you right so you can go swimming you can go running you can play sports you can dance you can do anything um like reva said you can't feel the cup once it's inside you and it's actually a lot more comfortable than wearing a pad and trying to exercise a lot of us have tried this we've tried doing different things using the cup and it's very comfortable it's not going to leak the suction is not going to break because you're moving around um, you can even in fact you can even do a handstand and the blood is not going to go back inside your uterus it cannot it's a one way canal it's not, it's only going to come out so you can do anything with the cup on how do you remove the cup there was a question about what happens if the cup gets stuck inside now you saw the anatomy at the start right the cervix is again a one way it's a one way track your cup if your cup is over here around your cervix there is no way that your cup can go inside it's never going to get lost okay it's going to be there uh, the first time you're using the cup it might feel a little bit scary to take it out you don't know how to take it out is it going is it stuck is it very far up um, all of these thoughts will go through your mind and it's just important to remember that you need to relax firstly because when you're tense you're going to suck up the cup and it's going to be very hard for you to take it out if you are relaxed it will be a lot easier also remember that on your menstrual cycle uh, the cervix comes a lot more so it's got easier to reach up now if you notice the cup has a stem right i hope you can see this the stem is not to pull out the cup the stem is just to locate your cup so some 
some menstruators have a higher cervix and that's why you need the stem so that when you put your finger inside, you can feel the base of the cup. How you take out the cup is you have to break the suction. Now we spoke about how the cup works on a vacuum or a suction uh, mechanism. You have to basically break that. So what you do is you put your finger inside, you press on the wall like this and that causes the suction to break. After that, you can just pinch it slightly, pull it out, and you can dump it, dump all the blood in the toilet. Okay? And the blood will just fall, it will just slip into the toilet because it's quite slippery. That's also going to help you while taking out the cup. It's not going to get stuck. Now, if you feel like you can't find the cup, relax a little bit and try to push down with your muscles. That would really help uh, for the cup to come lower. Um, once you've managed to take out the cup, okay, there's also uh, ridges at the base of the cup, so that can help you get a better grip if you're having trouble getting a grip. Okay, and most of the cups are made, since they're made out of med medical grade silicon, it does, uh, your fingers do stick to a little bit, so that should be helpful. Once the cup is out, and you can, the first time you take out the cup, you can try doing it in the shower just in case it spills a little bit. Um, over time in practice, you will get good at it and you can do it over the toilet as well. You just dump the blood, you rinse it with whatever water you have. So if you're in a public washroom, it's best if you can use your own uh, water. And if you're at home, you can just use the spray. And after you've done that, you just fold it and you reinsert it. That's all. So you don't have to take anything into the washroom, you don't have to take anything out. And it's extremely convenient, especially if you're not poor. Does it hurt is a question that we often get. It can, I'm not going to lie. It can hurt for some people and for some people it doesn't hurt. It really depends on you. And it's even if it does hurt, it's only going to hurt you the first time. Um, it's that one time mental strength that you have to, you know, just, you just have to do it. And um, once you've done it, it's not going to hurt again after that. Um, if you feel like a particular way that you're sitting or standing is hurting, you can try something else. So if standing is hurting, you can try sit, uh, sitting or squatting, see if that improves anything. You can also, while inserting, try putting a little bit of coconut oil or water-based lubricant and that might help the insertion process a little bit. Um, you can keep in the cup for about up to 12 hours. And if you have a light, okay, so what, there's a question, what if you have a very light phone day and it doesn't go in easily, will it hurt more at that point? It shouldn't. Um, ideally, by the time you've come to a light flow day, you're already going to be used to using the cup. You know how to insert it. It's only going to hurt the first time if it does hurt at all. So you don't need to be worried about it hurting every single time. Um, also, okay, so what is the appropriate age to start using this cup? Honestly, there's no age limit. You can use it at any time. But of course, it's going to be a little bit harder if you're very young. Um, usually, menstruators around 15 to 16 year old can easily use the cup. Um, if they're younger than that, it might be helpful to start off on something like a biodegradable pad or a cloth pad and then move to the cup eventually. Um, just because it's easier to insert when you're older. Um, in terms of which cup you have to buy, you get different sizes in the market. So there's small, medium, large usually. The size of the cup does not depend on your food. It only depends on your age and whether or not you've given birth. The difference in size is very minute. It's just a few millimeters in diameter and a few millimeters in height. So if you want to use a cup, you can always ask us and we can help you out with the size. Large is usually if you're above 25 or 30 years old and you've given birth. And small and medium is usually if you haven't given birth and you're anywhere uh, below 25 or 30 years old. This depends on the company, of course. And when you're buying that, you should keep it in mind. Um, Company-wise, we recommend one company called Rustic Art. We've all been using it for the past few years, I think, now. And we really haven't had much trouble. Um, it has four suction holes. So suction holes help you to create um, a better suction once the cup is inside and this prevents any leakage um, from the cup. I hope you can see them. If not, let me see if I can. Okay. I hope you can see them though. And Rustic Art is also a clear cup. So any color that's added to a cup is just an additional chemical and you really don't want 
more chemicals being added to your cup or to any product that you're using than there already are, um, which is why a clear cup is good. Price-wise, they can range between 300 rupees to up 3,000 or 4,000 rupees. It really depends on brand you go for. Indian brands tend to be a little cheaper and Rustic Art is 950 rupees. Um, there are some other companies like Ecofem which sell them for a little bit more expensive, but they're also decent cups. We can share a link with you with all the cup, um, cup companies afterwards. Rustic Art is providing um, cups during the quarantine, so if you order them, they will deliver. And just before moving on, I'll see if there's any questions that You can play a lot of sports with this. It's not going to affect anything. You can sleep with it, yes. Um, usually if you have a heavy flow, so um, what you do if you have a heavy flow is it might fill up over the night. So you change it just before you go to sleep. And as soon as you wake up, the first thing you do is go to the washroom and change your cup. Um, if you have a light flow, it's not at all an issue. You can definitely sleep with it. You can wear it for up to 12 hours. So that's comfortably, you know, your sleeping hours. Okay. Can anyone please recommend a sympathetic gynac? Uh, we can, we have a few gynacs. We can share their numbers with you after the session and you can see if they'd be willing. Okay, we'll talk about the hymen. There's a question about the hymen. So we will talk about that. Okay, um, we'll quickly just talk about the hymen and then we'll close the session. It's been an hour. So Ahana, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure, I'll talk about the hymen. So hi. So the hymen is a membrane that's at the entrance of the uterus. We often think of it as a wall that um, blocks the entrance. And um, when you think of breaking in the hymen, you think of something really violent, like a whole wall coming and something breaking here. But that's really not the case. Most Anna, can you keep your mic closer to your have mouth? A donut -shaped yeah, yeah, I'll go for it. I'll complete it again. Yeah, and please repeat from the start. Yes, yeah. So, um, someone asked a question about the hymen. Does your hymen break when you use the cup? So, we often think of a of the hymen as the wall covering our vagina, but that's not really the case. Most of the most of us have a hymen, like more than 50% of people have a hymen that looks like a donut. So it's uh, empty in the center and it only covers the sides. And uh, even this is only 50%. Some people, it only covers the ridges. In um, And it's also stretchable. So it doesn't always have to break. And... Like the fully covered wall, like hymen is very, very rare. So there was a study done and only 1% of babies have a completely intact hymen, which is also not like a wall, mostly like a donut shaped hymen, as I mentioned earlier. So why do, why are we scared of our hymen breaking? It has no actual purpose in, in our bodily functions. It is because it is related to this idea of virginity. So if you want, I'm just going to talk about that really briefly um, in two minutes. So the idea of virginity is, um, so virginity basically means the state of being sexually inexperienced. And it differs from similar words like um, chastity or purity is because it's viewed as a possession that we should have. So it's, it's something like... Um, Someone took my virginity, someone, um, I gave my virginity to someone. Um, some virginity is also sometimes bought and sold, not, and so it's basically used uh, and viewed as a materialistic possession. But the problem is not just this, it's because 
like we are worried so much about our hymen because in 17 countries including india virginity is also checked and these checks like if if your body confirms the standards of what a virgin body should look like which in india can mean having an intact hymen bleeding your first wedding night then everything is well and good but if this does not happen then it can lead in very, like the very distressful situations where there are honor killings people don't get jobs um you're thrown out of a marriage this is not because this is not because the person was not actually a virgin which is what i will come to is because of this belief of what a virgin body should look like so there was there are studies done which are even there are recent studies done and there are studies that are more than a hundred years old so the first study was done on um was done on a middle aged sex worker over a hundred years ago and um, they checked her hymen and her hymen was that of, was like a um was intact like a teenage virgin this is just because of how her hymen acts all our hymens are different and they act differently whereas then there was another study done more recently around 50 years back on 36 pregnant teenage pregnant women so from these there was only clear signs of penetration or any sort of loss of virginity in three of them and the rest were all their hymens were completely intact so in case you believe in other 30 like other 32 virgin births then this this is just another misconception of what a hymen is because clearly you couldn't tell more recently a study on 4000 women was done and that gave the same answer that there is no clear cut thing of when a hymen breaks and when a hymen doesn't break typically a hymen does break even if it's whatever shape it is is when that when um when you do have a sexual appearance uh, uh, experience that is not um done properly if you are actually properly lubricated your hymen never has to break in your entire life so it's a misconception and it's just an anatomical myth it's not really the truth so if you are worried about the hymen may breaking maybe you shouldn't use the cup it may or may not break because of using the car but the hymen can actually even break from running and using the bike even it actually can even break from walking and it every time you get your period your hymen membrane slightly breaks every time so then you should probably not do any of those things if you are really worried about the, that and um, the the truth is that this is just a tactic like the medical community has known this for hundreds of years that there are that, like this is just one anatomical myth there are several others and the medical community has known this but they still use things like virgin surgeries and things like that to gain money but it's not really true so you cannot it's just been used to control women and their lives and their freedom especially in a sexual fear and also in terms of work in a lot of places and you cannot look a uh, woman between her legs and know her reality so yeah that's it that's all i'd like to say about the hymen so Ravi, do you want to end the session yes hi i'm just briefly going to talk about a thing that's super important to talk about, which is that often we talk about menstruation as something that only women go through. And yes, it is a majority of people that are women who experience menstruation, but we must also recognize that not all women who not all women menstruate and not all those who menstruate are women so what i mean by that is that there are people who don't necessarily 
identify as women who can be non-binary folks, who can be, um, mm, who can be transgender people, who, um, yeah, and it's important to differentiate between that. And that's why every time that we talk about menstruation, we use the word menstruator instead of women, because when we use the word women, we are excluding a population of people who also menstruate but don't necessarily identify as women yeah it was amazing to have this session with you all and we are so 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 thankful that you took out the time to be here today and we hope that this has been a super useful session and i hope we hope that you will considering consider using sustainable options and if you have any questions please feel free to reach out. You can call us, email us. You can um, check out our um, website. It's on WordPress and also our Instagram page, our Facebook page. And if you want to buy cups, you can contact us as well. We have a lot. And yeah, also if you, if you know anyone who would want to have a session like this if you know a group of people who want a session like this we are happy to conduct more sessions with anyone thank you we also have a uh, fun competition going on right now called express menstruation so if any of you would like to express menstruation using art it can be dance art writing anything you want um please do send us your entry on our instagram page we have a link over there a form you can fill it in and you can always email us for any more information. If you'd like to stay back and ask us some questions, uh, you can definitely do that. We'll be on for another five minutes. Hey, uh, Anjali and uh, everybody else, uh, Surbi, Reva, Sayuri, Ahana, and also you have your newest member, right? Hey. Mahi, yes. Yes, Mahi, right. Time so, she conducted a session, by the way. It was so wonderful. So lovely. Yeah, this has been an amazing session, girls. And uh, we're so happy that, you know, we finally got to do this after so, so many days. Um, and would just like a quick, just an intro of what you guys are doing and where you guys are right now. Sure. Um, I can start. Yeah. So I I'm currently studying at Ashoka University and I'm in, I just finished my first year, I'm going to my second year. I'm studying a major in sociology and a minor in environmental science and I'm continuing Amara there as well. I'm also a part of a few different environmental organizations and just like that. I run the environmental ministry in Ashoka. So that is where I am at right now. Great. Surbi. Hi, I'm currently in Canada. I'm studying liberal arts at Quest University, which is a little um, north of Vancouver. And I, well, since the lockdown, I haven't been able to come home because of a lot of reasons. But essentially, I'm in Canada right now. And yeah. Great. Ahana? Hi, so right now um, I'm studying, I'm doing a BA honors in art history. Um, I'm studying through distance learning. Um, of course, al also doing Amara sessions and I have a brand with my sister that we're starting and that's based on Again, sustainability, and there are some handicrafts in India that only a few artisans still practice. So we're working along with them to come up with products everyone can buy. And I also do some freelance work of writing and design, and I also love art. Yeah, that's it. Nice. Reva? Is Reva there? Yes, she should be. Okay, till then Sayuri is, if Sayuri's internet is good, uh, it'll be great to have. 
as your what she's doing now? I think Sayuri's Wi-Fi is quite bad. I don't know if she. Yeah, why don't you just uh, tell me about Reva, what Reva is doing and what Sayuri is doing. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah, uh, Anjali or Surubi, one of you can just tell what they're doing. Um, both Reva and Sayuri are in Pune right now and Sayuri is going to start university next fall in September in Canada. And Reva is doing interior design at a college that's on Deccan. Great. Cool. Hey, thanks. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming over for this webinar. Uh, this was a wonderful webinar by the Project Amara. And what's even more special is this is an initiative by DLRC alumni started out as a project uh, at DLRC and it's encouraging to see the growth in their knowledge, confidence, and last but not the least, their conviction. Uh, so we really look to create such impactful thought for action leaders. Uh, and uh, we've we really like to tell the story about, you know, what are the kind of programs that create such leaders and we have some open houses coming up. Um, so you can come over there if you want to really know more about how do we really motivate students to be such active citizens. Um, so you will get more information about the project Amara uh, in an email. Uh, so I will forward that and uh, yeah, keep, keep in touch with the project Amara and their work on Instagram. And looking forward to see you guys on the later webinars too. Thank you. So if there are everyone. So officially we kind of have closed the webinar. If, if we can take like two minutes, if anybody wants to ask any questions per se, we can just stay on for two minutes and I know it's late. Um, this is Shannon. I had a quick question. There was a lot of good information uh, there, and I want to make sure that we get all of it because, um, uh, well, I, I would just like to start uh, trying new things. So, um, is it how do I access all of that information? What would I do? Is there? I guess I would go on the website of this NGO. What you can do is when we were start when we started this project out initially we realized that there was way too much information online and we got a little bit confused to be honest so we've added it all on our website um, the websites in the uh, presentation uh, the project amara.wordpress.com and we've right. put it out over there so if you'd like you can go through that we have some videos we have some illustrations uh, which take you through different products we also talk about the science um, common you know, homemade remedies that you can use on when you have period cramps. We have information about the moon cycle and the season cycle, which are um, ancient folklores of sort, um, which you can read up about. So we compile all of this there. And of course, you can always reach out to us and we can point you towards a good website or um, YouTube channel if you'd like some more information. Great, thank you so much. Uh, just a, a just a side comment. Um, I know you don't need the kudos. I'm sure you guys are are very much uh, confident and proud. Uh, but I wanted to tell you that I sure do appreciate what you guys are doing, and uh, it's sorely needed everywhere, not just uh, here, but even in the Western countries, U.S. Um, there's just not enough talk about it, and not enough awareness among females or uh, menstruators, I should say, but um, men as well, or people who don't menstruate. Um, uh, so I applaud you, and I think what you're doing is really, really cool, and I, I'm super excited for the next steps. Congratulations, and keep moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I, I uh, can I add something? Yes, please. Uh, so I think uh, I totally agree with uh, what was just said and I yeah I believe that this talk about periods and uh, menstruation should be uh, be spread everywhere because a lot of people don't get this information and uh, a lot of people need this information like in small villages which it's really really important 
and yeah i hope uh, that one day this that all happens because this uh, this is a really important talk that needs to be done everywhere and you guys are amazing by what all you have just done over here you are amazing people and i am really thankful for the session thank you so much Okay, if you have any more questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we have our number on the screen, and there's also our email address, and as well as our Instagram. So you can either DM us, email us, or text us and call us, and we will definitely help you out with anything if you'd like to organize a session. So thank you so much for coming, and good night. Hey, thank you everybody. And yes, this is signing off. Thank you, girls, for making this happen. This is finally happening. Yeah. So this recording is going to be available on the DLRC YouTube channel as well as I'm going to uh, request Amara to also keep it on their YouTube channel or on Instagram. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great night, everybody. Night.